Cheers and salutations. My name is Kit, and welcome one and all to Americans Learn. And today we have ourselves an interesting video, and this is feedback from all of you in regards to our previous video uh, in which we checked out about Finland and its role in the Second World War. So, again, all you hip cool cats always keep on delivering, and after all, we do read the comments. So, uh, look, your feedback is fundamentally important for the growth of this channel, and for that, we are grateful for your support. So, uh, again, this video is from the Armchair Historian, World War II from Finland's perspective, animated history. So, it is the first time checking out this channel, as well as checking out their content. So, uh, without further ado, if this is content that all of you like, please type, type, type in the comment section below. Uh, we won't know what to do unless we hear it from all of you first. But also, also, this is very important. Please, please support the original content creators. The original link to the video is in the description box below. So after this video, click on the original link and subscribe to the original content creator. It's the right thing to do. A lot of time, effort, and energy is made into making these videos. We're, we're having fun learning, but it's also important and the right thing to do to support the original content creators. So grab yourself a tasty snack, grab yourself a tasty beverage, and let's get ready to play this video in a three, a two, a one. Horrible timing for that deer to show up. Once you deal with those uh, soldiers, go ahead and g get yourself some elk or deer or whatever that is. People of Finland, if that's a deer or an elk, please correct me. I, I probably offended a lot of people. <laughs> hashtag that's an elk or hashtag that's a deer. <laughs> Hi, I'm Griffin Johnson, the Armchair Historian. In the First and Second World Wars, no place was unaffected, including the usually quiet Scandinavian region. The First World War saw the Russian Empire fall, and its Soviet inheritor lose control of the territory now known as the Republic of Finland in the Finnish Civil War of 1918. Wow. The Finns, long imperial subjects to the Romanovs, declared and defended their independence with the aid of the dying German Empire, as the pro-independence whites fought against the Soviet-backed Reds. I never knew that. I never knew that Finland was an occupied territory of the Russian Empire, or that it also played a role in the, I guess, what would eventually lead to the rise up of the Soviet Union, and it would be in the middle of uh, uh, of its own fight for independence. I I interesting to point out, it's a little bit off subject, a little bit off subject, but maybe only a handful of you might have some relatives, and, and if you did have some relatives who were part of that expedition, please share in the comment section below. But my, uh, my great-grandfather was actually part of the Polar Bear Expedition, I think that's what it's called, the, the Polar Bear Expedition to, for the Trans-Siberian Railroad in Russia. Uh, or what would soon be the Soviet Union, uh, was the U.S. Army. Uh, during that time, I actually still have a copy of his uh, discharge papers and his uh, service, as well as the expedition that he was part of. So um, if you had a relative, hey, sh share their story in the comment section below. I would uh, love to see it, but it's it's just it's just... Just, just a little bit of tidbit of information. Not not related to Finland at all, just and completely different subject area at all. But uh I I, I never I never knew about Finland though. That that is that is interesting. Who sought to make Finland a new socialist republic under Soviet control. But the white victory over the Reds would prove little more than a respite, and Soviet hunger for revenge and reconquest would see Finland become a battlefield in the Second World War. 
bundle up, because in today's episode, we'll be examining the Second World War from the Finnish perspective. Before we make for the Finnish frontier, we'd like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Omaze. By giving away one-of-a-kind prizes and experiences while fundraising for nonprofits across the world, Omaze ensures that the best causes spend less of their time fundraising and more time helping those in need. Omaze is currently helping out Give Power and 501c3, and giving you the chance to win a Tesla Model X Plaid in the process. Give Power is on a mission to help the 2.2 billion people across the globe lacking access to clean drinking water by using solar energy. 501c3 rests at the intersection of innovation and storytelling, using their skills to spotlight solutions for a cleaner, more sustainable future while creating a new nonprofit for a younger generation. By logging on to omaze.com slash armchairhist and supporting these charities, you will be entered for a chance to win a Tesla Model X Plaid, Tesla's flagship SUV. With supercar stats, 1,020 horsepower, 313 miles of all-electric range, and 0 to 60 in 2.5 seconds, the Model X is Tesla's most sought-after car with a full six-month waitlist. But by supporting Give Power and 501c3, you could jump the line. Visit omaze.com slash armchairhist or click the link in the description below to enter for your chance to win. Okay, I, I'll let that commercial play out. Seem, seems important. I, I don't know if it's still happening or not, so... If you want to help out, go ahead, I guess. From the moment her independence was assured, Finland's foreign policy and military planning revolved around a single, unifying thought. Do not let Russia conquer us. The Whites had formed a national government that was staunchly anti-communist, but was well aware that the USSR was the regional power in their corner of Europe. Thus, the Finns walked a tightrope as they sought to protect their independence without provoking a second Russian invasion, and a central tenet of this balancing act was seeking out foreign aid. The Weimar Republic, heir to the Finns' Imperial German allies, maintained cordial relations with the Soviet Union, disappointing pro-German elements in Finland and putting the kibosh on future military assistance from Berlin. The British Empire, who Finland had previously granted access to naval bases, was uninterested in any talks beyond trade negotiations. Lacking powerful allies, Finland settled into a holding pattern, wary eyes cast east toward their once and future enemy. The ascension of Adolf Hitler would upend this stalemate. The Nazis were even more anti-communist than the Whites, and Hitler ended the détente enjoyed by Weimar Germany and the Soviet Union. His manifesto, Mein Kampf, called for a literal war against the ideology of communism itself. The Finns were heartened by this development. Though there were very few fascists in Finland, there was hope that Germany would offer a counterbalance to the Soviet Union. Ah, oh, man. I already see where this is going. It's bad news bears all around. Jeez Louise. Because on the one hand, you got the Soviets, but then, ugh, backing you in your corner is the Third Reich. Ow. Puts a pit in my stomach. I've seen a rock in a hard place. Jeez Louise. Baron Karl Gustav Mannerheim, leader of the Whites in the Civil War and a founding father of Finland, had long worried about the modernization and mechanization of the Soviet Red Army, and spoke of how the French had burned up their military budget with the Maginot Line, and the British had allowed themselves to become militarily complacent. The pragmatists in Helsinki, Mannerheim among them, began to realize that the fate of their nation was slipping out of their hands, and into those of the great powers who resisted demilitarization, namely the Soviet Union and Nazi Germany. As early as 1935, Soviet officers began making conspicuous trips to the Finnish frontier, resulting in railroad spurs that began to crawl mile by mile toward Finland. In 1938, Soviet diplomats approached Helsinki with requests to negotiate a new Finnish-Soviet border. 
Despite Mannerheim's lobbying to sit with the Reds, Helsinki declined. It mattered little to the Soviets, as the next year they signed the Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact, the secret protocols of which put Finland in the Soviet sphere of influence. The Nazis and Soviets began expanding in accordance to the pact in 1939, and Finland hurriedly fortified her eastern border. Volunteers constructed the Mannerheim Line, which would go on to serve the Finns well. In October, the Soviets approached the Finns with a new request, to lease strategically important territory within Finland and a declaration of Finnish military support. In exchange, the Finns were assured their continued independence and peace with the Soviets. Oh, what could possibly go wrong? What could possibly, possibly go wrong? Already you're being told to give up your land, give up strategic areas, and we won't hurt you. Whenever somebody says that to you, slap them in the mouth. Well, don't get caught on camera, but slap them in the mouth if they say that. Give us this and we won't hurt. You. No. There were many Finns, including the ever eager Mannerheim, who saw through this charade. Scores of Finns reported to recruiting stations. Even far left social democrats signed up to fight Soviet aggression. That aggression would come steaming into Finland at 8 o'clock in the morning on November 30th, 1939. This winter war was meant by the Soviets to be a blowout victory, and their initial thrusts into Finland were met with absolutely no chance of victory. The dogged Finns stood firm, bogging the underprepared Soviets down and inflicting heavy losses on them. The entire offensive lurched to a stop. The Soviets had spread their troops along the entire Finnish border. Now, what I remember in the previous videos is how cold it did get in Finland. Now, uh, to our, if, if we have any viewing audience members, any cool, cool, no pun intended, cool people from Finland, uh, how cold does it get in Finland? Now, I know it can get cold here in Chicago, but I'm willing to bet 10 out of 10 that, uh, Finland, uh, Finland gets ice cold. So, uh, well, how, if, if, if we got any fin, uh, people from Finland, tell us how cold does it get? Also, uh, I just realized that that probably was an elk in the earlier part of the video, not a deer. If if I if I offended any elk enthusiasts, I am truly sorry. <laughs> I'm trying not to be a speciest. Stretching their forces too thin to mount an effective offense, and the Reds sat dead in the water until February 1st of 1940. Second verse, same as the first, the Red Army stormed into the Karelian Isthmus, a strategically critical area of Finland, with 30 infantry divisions and strong artillery and air support, only to again be stopped in their tracks by the Finns and their Mannerheim line. One of the Finns facing the Soviet onslaught was Simo Hauha, the legendary White Death. Scion of a farming family, Simo had spent his childhood hunting and skiing, skills many other Finns had developed. Throughout the Winter War, Hauha would become a veritable boogeyman to the Russians, racking up over 500 confirmed kills and surviving oh! numerous- 500 kills?! Oh, wow. Wow, uh, wow. Uh, if there's any book or documentary on this guy, please share in the comment section below. I got to read this because, you know, the only other uh, obviously there's 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 a lot of snipers in, in, in the Second World War. I never heard of this individual. I've never heard of this individual. Audience type 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 in the comment section below. If you have anything that you would recommend that we should check out. Your feedback is fundamentally important. This would be cool to check out. ...Soviet attempts on his life. The Soviets, hemorrhaging manpower in the face of Finnish defiance, dug in their heels and kept leaning, finally breaking through the enemy line on February 13th. Within two weeks, the Soviets had pushed deep into Finland, driving the Finnish right to the city of Vipri. Finland was on the ropes, her troops battling exhaustion as much as the Soviets, and supplies had drawn critically low. 
France and Britain offered to send an expeditionary force to aid Finland if Norway and Sweden would provide staging grounds. Norway and Sweden told Helsinki that they would not allow troops onto their soil, sealing Finland's fate. Oh no. March 13th would bring the end of hostilities, and the two sides entered what would be called the Interim Peace, which saw Finland cede land to the Soviets, and the Soviets refrain from annexing the entire nation. As the blood in the snow dried, Finland set about preparing for the next fight against the Soviets. The Finnish population emerged from the war shaken, but resolved to carry on. Over 24,000 Finns fell in battle, including the White Death, Simo Hauha, whose killing by a Soviet infantryman's high explosive bullet was reported in the Finnish newspapers, only for Hauha to spring back to life on the same day the Winter War ended, and undergo a marathon of surgeries that left him alive but permanently disfigured. So in other words, yes, the details of my death have been greatly exaggerated. I'm okay. <laughs> I'm not dead. I was in a coma. <laughs> Think about it. Johnny. There's probably no one in Finland named Johnny. You wrote this article. Well, the person who's dead is not dead. You got to apologize to the people. <laughs> The inhabitants of the Karelian Isthmus, which the Soviets annexed in the peace, were given only 10 days to cross the newly redrawn Finnish border. 420,000 people grabbed whatever they could carry and left their ancestral homes behind, but were welcomed to new homes by their countrymen. Tracts of private land were nationalized and were given to the refugees to rebuild on. Veterans of the Civil War, white and red alike, formed brothers in armed societies to socialize and keep spirits high in the company of fellow soldiers. These were countered by the Finnish Soviet Union Peace and Friendship Society, a Moscow-backed fifth column ordered to provoke a justification for a new Soviet attack. The government doubled the length of conscription and launched a charm offensive on neighboring countries to conclude defensive alliances. Throughout the end of March 1940, Finland lobbied Norway, Sweden, and Denmark to form a Nordic mutual defense network, but the Soviets issued a public declaration that any country signing any alliance with Finland would be declaring themselves an enemy of global peace and, more importantly, the Soviet Union. Norway, Sweden, and Denmark stopped returning Finland's calls not long thereafter. Oh, they got ghosted. That's how sad. But I guess that's dating in any era. <laughs> and by spring of 1940, Norway and Denmark had been occupied by Germany. France had fallen and Finland found itself not only politically isolated, but with Soviet and German troops on her borders. Speaking of the Germans, the fall of Norway led to the opening of diplomatic channels between the Nazis and Finns. Initial contact focused on allowing German troops on leave from posts in Norway free passage through Finland, and welcoming Finland to purchase weapons and raw materials from Germany. As relations improved, Finnish Major General Paavo Talvila began making regular trips to Berlin, taking the Germans' temperature on a defensive treaty against the Soviets. At the end of May 1941, a delegation from Finland's high command, led by Chief of Staff Axel Heinrichs, took a meeting with German Chief of Staff Alfred Jodl. Jodl gave Heinrichs a briefing on Operation Barbarossa, which he dutifully related to Helsinki. The Finns smelled blood in the water. Oh no. This is, this is, this is bad. I would not be so happy about Operation Barbarossa because, listen, the only people who have ever successfully conquered the landmass, the nation that would one day be known as Russia, would be Genghis Khan and his fantastic friends. That's it. That's also the only people who really pulled it off. Napoleon, Germans, no. no, no nobody has. Only except for Genghis Khan and his fantastic friends. Here was the military alliance that had so long eluded them. The two countries inked a deal. Germany would support Finland in any future wars against the Soviets, and the Finns would support Germany if Barbarossa triggered a Soviet invasion of Finland. 
To say the Finns threw themselves into their new alliance would be an understatement. A secret conference was held in Kiel, where Finnish and German planners laid out designs for jointly laid minefields in the Gulf of Finland. And the Finns opened their airfields at Malm and Ute to the Luftwaffe. On June 5th, Mannerheim reactivated Talvilla, apprising him of the results of the Kiel Conference and sharing Germany's timetable for invading the Soviet Union. He concluded by asking Talvilla to take command of a Finnish task force that would lead the German drive to Leningrad. Talvilla enthusiastically replied, I Listen, I think we all know how Stalingrad played out, but Leningrad was the same way too. A lot of people ain't gonna make it home. I accept, and this is the greatest moment of my life. Finnish Defense Minister Rudolf Walden ordered full mobilization on June 17th, and the Finns were able to call up 630,000 men and women for their anticipated war, one of whom was our old friend Simo Hauha, whose attempts to join a combat unit were rejected. The White Death would be assigned to the Horse Call-Up Board, and set his sights on determining which equine Finns should be drafted for service. What? <clears throat> After doing all that? Oh, come on. Come on! Odd assignments or not, optimism was high in the Finnish populace. The populace as a whole believed that the Nazis would be quick to reach their objectives in Russia, and with a swift German victory, most Finns would be demobilized. <laughs> oh, oh, oh no! Oh no, 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 no! That's, that's not how this is gonna play out. <laughs> Spoiler alert, it ain't gonna look out too good for the Germans. Especially the cold winter of, uh, 1941. Quick, quick German victory. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay, yeah, that ain't gonna happen. When the Germans poured over the Soviet border on June 22nd, the Finns remained behind. But that meant nothing to the Reds. The Soviets launched a massive bombing and shelling campaign on the Finnish border with neither a declaration of war nor a Finnish attack to justify their assault. The Finns submitted an official letter of reprimand to the Soviet ambassador, who ignored it entirely. On the 23rd, Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov demanded the Finns lay out their position on their allies' invasion and promptly cut the phone line to Helsinki. After all, it's far easier to claim the other party is refusing to be diplomatic if there's no way for them to speak with you. On June 25th, 1941, the Soviets launched an early morning bombing raid on Finnish civilian targets, with 487 aircraft dropping ordnance on cities including Helsinki. The interim peace was over. The Finns watched as the Germans drove into Soviet territory, waiting for their time to join the fray. The Finnish government took great plans to portray themselves as a co-belligerent fighting a common enemy alongside the Germans. Never concluding- Not, oh, oh boy. <laughs> that one person who thinks you're their friend, and you're just like, oh no, I am not your friend. Oh. It ain't go, this ain't gonna work out too good. Just again, just just to see that. Welcome, my new ally. Yeah, a formal alliance with the Nazis. <laughs> that stare of, no. Oh, how did it? I I like that face right there. Whoever drew this, it's like, yeah, that's me. You're probably wondering how I got here. The ministers in Helsinki knew it was vital to portray this as a war to reclaim territory and defend <laughs> against Soviet aggression. <laughs> On July 10th, the Germans crossed the river Daugava, which was the pre-arranged time for the Finns to attack. The continuation war was on. 475,000 Finnish soldiers charged against the Soviets, who had directed their best men to defend against the main German assault. Soviet disposition meant that the Finns enjoyed air superiority and the tactical advantage, and they overran the Soviets in the Karelian Isthmus and other territories lost in the Winter War. But this was not the end of Finnish ambitions. They meant to make for Leningrad, just as they promised. 
the Finns split their forces, with some digging in to defend the Karelian Isthmus, while others crossed into Soviet territory. Finnish forces reached the River Sphere on the 7th of September, and it was here that the small Nordic Republic could have sealed the fate of the Soviet juggernaut. If the Germans had linked up with the Finns at the Sphere as originally planned, they could have cut Leningrad's shipping lanes over Lake Ladoga, bottling up the city in a complete siege. But the Germans were halted 100 kilometers or about 62 miles from the river. The Finnish halt at the Sphere marked the end of offensive operations for the rest of the war. The momentum was shifting, and soon the Finns would find themselves fighting a desperate three-year defense. Finland's fortunes were directly tied to their German co-belligerents, and when Barbarossa began to flounder, the Soviets turned their ire on the Republic. As in the Winter War, waves of Soviet conscripts broke upon the Karelian Isthmus, trying to unseat the Finnish defenders. The Finns fought nose to nose with the Soviets, but again like the Winter War, their energy and resources were sapped with every battle, while the Soviets called up more and more men and materiel. Like <clears throat> whoever drew that bear in the background it's like a like a power animal like somebody's summoning up a uh like an avatar when you when you play like a, a uh one of these uh video game or something like that ah uh, tying yourself to the germans during that time bad idea but at the time i guess they thought it was right but it wasn't gonna work and I think we've seen plenty of, video, uh, plenty of videos explaining why the Germans were never going to win. And again, just going to reiterate this. I find alternate history books that show what would happen if Germany won the second one. I find those books to be lazy. The Germans were never going to win. <clears throat> I'm just going to say this again. The Germans were never going to win the Second World War. It, it, just, it just wasn't going to happen. Horse-drawn carriages. No. Mannerheim realized he must surrender Karelia and ordered the troops holding the Isthmus into a fighting retreat. The Finns withdrew in good order, even winning a defensive victory at the Bloody Battle of Attrition at Tali i Hantala in 1944, which placed the idea in Soviet minds that Finland may be more trouble than it was worth. For his part, Stalin was ready to consolidate his forces and drive to Berlin. He had bigger borscht to stew, and the Finns were equally keen to reach a separate peace with the Soviets. Okay, okay, I got, I, I got, I gotta do the meme. Let him cook. Let him cook. There were, however, 214,000 barriers to separate peace between the Finns and Soviets, and they were the men of the German 20th Mountain Army based in the Finnish region of Lapland. On September 14, 1944, a Finnish delegation headed by Foreign Minister Karl Enkel met with their Soviet counterparts to discuss ending hostilities. They were blindsided with demands to cede the Petsamo Peninsula and for a forced lease of Porkala naval base near Helsinki. In addition to these concessions, Finland would pay the Soviets the equivalent of $300 million in reparations, allow Soviet troops free access to and passage through their country, and arrest a list of war criminals to be tried by Allied courts. Allowing the Red Army free reign in the country meant a Soviet occupation was inevitable, but the Finns felt they had little choice in the matter and signed the Moscow Armistice five days later. Wow. The Finns requested the Germans withdraw from Lapland, setting a two-week deadline that the Finns and Germans both knew could not be realistically met, just like the Soviets wanted. The Moscow Armistice required the Finns to use force against any Germans left in their country after the two weeks had elapsed, which would mean war between Finland and Germany. That war came on September 28th, as the Germans were trying to make the 1,100 kilometer or 683 mile trek from their positions in Lapland to occupied Norway. Slowed by the size of their force and the small fact that it was the middle of an Arctic winter, the Germans could only do so much to adhere to the Finnish deadline. The Finns, for their part, delayed to the best of their ability, but the Soviets threatened to invade Finland yet again if they did not expel the Germans by force, and this time the Soviets would keep the entire country. Finnish forces met the Nazi rearguard on the 28th, ordering them to surrender before opening fire. The Germans resisted fiercely, giving the Finns a taste of their own medicine with defensive works including minefields, grenade booby traps, and scorched earth warfare. 
The Lapland War would last until April of 1945, the end of hostilities on continental Europe. Throughout all of this, however, a terrible injustice was being carried out behind Finnish lines. East Karelia, a section of land long disputed between Russia and Finland, came under occupation by the Finns during the Continuation War, an occupational government with Finnish nationalist Vaina Kotilainen at its head. Kotilainen's government had three aims, develop Eastern Karelia, convince the population to integrate into the Republic of Finland, and eliminate foreign enemies. Many Russians living in the region were rounded up and placed in internment camps. The vast majority of the 24,000 interned in these camps were women, children, and elderly, as the men had long ago been called up to fight in the Red Army. A bad harvest in 1941 paired with the rough conditions of the camps resulted in the deaths of thousands. It is estimated that the death toll for the camps was 18%, with Russian sources claiming a toll as high as 33%. By summer of 1945, the war in Europe had ended. Finland, though required to cede roughly 10% of its land and lease bases to the Soviets, was not occupied. Helsinki became the only capital city of a continental combatant to have never been occupied, and went into the Cold War an island of republican democracy in the Warsaw Pact. Finland had lost two major wars since 1939, yet had miraculously kept its independence. The Finnish story in the Second World War is one of grit, determination, and a total unwillingness to bow down before powers stronger than oneself. But it is also the tale of hatred, where nationalists were allowed to try their hand at ethnic cleansing in East Karelia. The Second World War from Finland's perspective is a complicated viewpoint to take one grounded in republican ideals and national pride, but also subject to paranoia and reprehensible actions in extremism. Don't forget about your- Wow, there's a lot to unpack there. Talk about a country that really dealt with a lot. I had no idea Finland went through all of that during the Second World War. Um, you know, because again, when we think of World War II, we think of obviously the Pacific War, but also, I guess, mainland Europe, we, the history books, the documentaries, uh, always show France being occupied, the invasion of Poland, uh, the allied invasion of Italy, Normandy, etc. Um, but I never knew the complex history of what happened to Finland. That's entirely brand new. And for that, a huge thank you, first of all, to the armchair historian, but also to you, our viewing audience. Uh, many of you suggested from a previous video that we checked out about Finland that we should check this out. So um, you guys and gals, you hip cool cats are really awesome. Um, so if there's anything else in regards to this, because now I'm hungry for a little bit more knowledge about Finland and really what else happened to it and the individuals that played a key role in the overall conflicts that was taking place between Finland and the Soviet Union and that odd and delicate and controversial relationship and alliance with the Third Reich. I mean, ugh. talk about having that odd person where somebody taps you on the shoulder and say, hey, you're, why, why are you friends with that dude again? Again, it's it's it, it's interesting, but I also want to know more about that sniper. So if there's any more videos about the White Death, please type, type, type in the comment section below. Until then, folks, uh, please take good care of yourselves. Keep your heads on a swivel. Drink water. Keep on winning. And uh, seriously, thank you all for the awesome, awesome suggestions. If there's any other suggestions or content that we should check out, type in the comment section below. Yes, we do read the comment section. So... Your feedback is fundamentally important. Take care.